Welcome to the Invest for More Real Estate Podcast. My name is Mark Ferguson, and I am your host. I'm a house flipper. I flip 10 to 15 houses a year. I own 13 rental properties with a goal to buy 100 by 2023. I'm also a real estate agent. I've been licensed since 01. I run a team of nine. We sell close to 200 houses a year. So on this show, we like to interview house flippers, landlords, and the best real estate agents in the business. So stay tuned for some great shows. If you want more information on my rentals, on the numbers, how I buy properties, check out investformore.com. Hey everyone, Mark Ferguson with Invest For More. Today it's going to be just me, going to be talking about money and real estate investing. I get emails all the time from all types of different people all over the world, you know, asking about money. They don't have enough money. They want to know how much money they need. You know, one reason why you're investing in real estate is because you want to make more money. You want passive income. You want to become wealthy. And it's a key point about how much do you actually need to start investing in real estate. And on this podcast, I'm going to talk about the different types of investing, how much money you need, different markets you need different amounts of money, different types of homes you need different amounts of money, different occupancy statuses you need different amounts of money. There's just so many variables that go into how much money you need to invest in real estate. And there's no one answer. And there's also a lot of things you can do if you don't have money. You can't. You shouldn't just give up and forget about it. There's a lot of ways to fix that problem of actually having money as well. So I'm going to try and go through the basics on flipping, rentals, even wholesaling, and even agencies if you want to become a real estate agent. How much money you'll need, how long it takes to make money, and then if you don't have money, what you can do to try and find that money and be successful in what I think is a really awesome business. All right. So before we get started, of course, if you're interested in any more of these subjects, you know, I've got paperback books on being a real estate agent, on buying rental properties, on flipping, on negotiating real estate, and planning and attitude, which is a huge part of of success in anything. So make sure you check those out. Um, The book on negotiating real estate, which I wrote with Jay Scott, is out as an audio book now. It's doing fantastic. And I am also working on turning my fix and flip book into an audio book. So completely rewrote it. The new version will be out soon. And the audio version will be out hopefully in a month or two. It takes them a long time to get it published, but we'll we'll see how soon it happens. All right. So the first thing I want to talk about, kind of what my website, what the blog was built on back in 2013 when I started, was rental properties. How much money do you need to invest in rental properties? When you say you want to invest in real estate, of course, that's the first thing you need to decide. Are you talking about buying rentals? Are you talking about flipping? Are you talking about wholesaling? What do you mean by investing? There's so many different things that you can do to buy real estate or be involved in it. So that's the first step. And so we'll talk about rentals because that's something I think many people come to the site for and they want to learn about. As an investor, if you're buying a house as an investor, you're never going to live in it. Most banks will require at least 20% down to buy a rental property. Some banks will require more. But if you're buying your first property, your first investment property, you should be able to find a bank that will let you put 20% down. So if you go through the numbers, let's say you buy a $100,000 house, you would have to put $20,000 down as your down payment to buy that property. However, that's not all the money you need. You would also need closing costs. So it costs money to get that loan. Um, The bank will charge, you know, origination fees or points as they're sometimes called, which could be, you know, one point two points, depending on the bank you're using. If you end up using hard money, it can be you know, up to four points, much more much more difficult. Usually, you know, one or two points is common for regular banks. You might have an appraisal fee, which could be 400 to $800, depending on the property in the area you are located in. There could be a closing fee with a title company, or if you have to use an attorney in your state, which could be a couple hundred dollars up to, you know, $500, sometimes more. There's recording fees, flood certification fees, Sometimes the banks have, you know, a dock processing fee. Basically, the closing costs are going to be two to four percent of the loan in most cases, um, or two two to four percent of the purchase price, really. So if you're buying a hundred thousand dollar house, you're probably going to pay two thousand to four thousand dollars in costs when you're getting a loan on that property. You can ask the seller to pay some of those costs for you. So say you're buying a house for a hundred thousand dollars, you can say, "Hey, I'll buy this house for one hundred two thousand dollars." 
if the seller agrees to pay two thousand dollars for my closing costs, it's the same thing as offering them a hundred thousand dollars. So you can lower that, but sometimes it's easier, it's quicker. You get your offer accepted more often if you don't ask the seller to pay closing costs. So we'll just assume that's the cost on there. So your hundred thousand dollar you know property you're buying, you've got to put twenty thousand dollars for down payment, maybe another three thousand dollars for closing costs. You're up to twenty three thousand dollars you need to buy that house. But that's not it either. (laughs) There will be reserves you have to have with most banks. So most banks don't want you to use every single cent to buy this house. They want you to have some money left in the bank to cover unexpected vacancies, repairs, things that might pop up. And most banks will require six months in reserves for the house you're buying and any other mortgages you have. So if you have a primary house and your mortgage payment is $1,000 a month, and this mortgage payment on the new house is going to be $500 a month, they would want six months in reserves to make sure you can pay that $1,500 a month, which would be, what, $9,000. So you've got to have an extra $9,000 in the bank on top of the down payment, um, usually on top of the closing costs, to make sure you're safe in the bank size. And I think that is a very good way to do things. I do not think you should be skimping by spending every single dime you have to buy a house with no money left over for vacancies, for repairs, because those do happen. Those do come up. We also have not talked about any repairs needed. So if you buy a house, it's great condition, immaculate, you can rent it right away. Great. Awesome. You might not have to to spend much money on repairs. However, if you want to get a good deal, if you want to make instant money in real estate by buying below market value you might have to buy a house that needs repairs. So if it needs $5,000, $10,000, $15,000 in repairs, you've got to remember to calculate that as well into your figures for buying the rental property. That's kind of the strategy I have used is buying houses that need work. I'll put 20% down, pay for the repairs out of pocket, pay for the down payment out of pocket. That's kind of my built-in equity into the property. So I might buy a house for $100,000, put $10,000 of work into it. The house would be worth, oh, at least $130,000 when I do that. I want, you know, equity when I have to make repairs. Hopefully it's worth one hundred forty dollars or 150000 And now I've got a loan of $80,000 on a house that's worth $150,000. So a lot of equity right there. And I put about $20,000 for the down payment, say $3,000 for the closing costs. $10,000 for the repairs to the property, I put about $23,000, not counting any carrying costs, into that property. I'm sorry, $33,000. But if you have to take a few months to repair the house, you know, you might be paying taxes, insurance, mortgage payments while you hold it. So you might have, you know, $35,000 of cash into that property, which seems like a lot. But, you know, you've got almost that much money in equity from buying the house is a good deal. You should be cash flowing every month if you do it right, making you know a few hundred dollars a month at least. And eventually you may be able to refinance and take that money out as well. Well, it's not like that money is stuck in the property forever. So that gives you the real basic, easy, simple way to buy a rental property that takes quite a bit of money. You know, not everybody has $35,000 laying around to invest, but it's usually pretty safe. You have a lot of equity and banks will most likely lend to you if you're in that financial situation. However, not everyone has that much money to buy a rental. So what are some other ways that you can buy for cheaper? Well, there's always the buying a rental with private money or hard money to begin with and refinancing it. So you can get a loan from a hard money lender or a private investor, say a friend, family member, another investor you know, and Maybe you can finance you know, 90%, maybe even 100% of the purchase price. It's tough to do with hard money. With private money, you might be able to finance 100% of the purchase price. Plus, you might be able to finance some of those repairs. Maybe you can finance you know, $10,000 for repairs or 5000 So what you end up doing is you have a loan for instead of $80,000 when you put 20% down. Now you've got a loan, let's just say, for $95,000 plus another $5,000 in repairs, you've got a loan for $100,000. So now, you know, instead of spending $35,000 for the repairs, down payment, all of that, you're spending more like $10,000 to $15,000 
for the repairs, the down payment, carrying costs, closing costs. But hard money and private money loans are usually short term. You pay higher rates, you're going to probably pay you know eight to twelve percent instead of four to six percent. You might get from a bank. You might be paying two points instead of one, or even three points or more on the hard money and private money loans. You're going to be more expensive. You can refinance those loans if you don't take cash out. You can usually refinance those loans right away with a conventional loan. So you can pay off the full loan amount, but you can't take cash out if you finance right away. That means you can get a conventional loan for you know, $100,000 if that's what your private money loan was, your hard money loan was. Pay it off, have a much lower interest rate, and a long-term loan in place. However, going this route saves you cash, but it t- costs you more money because you're getting two loans, which have two origination fees. It's going to cost you at least a few thousand dollars more to do that because of the costs, the interest rates, and the additional fees you incur. Now, if you can get a private money loan or hard money loan for six months or a year, you might be able to refinance that property based on a new appraisal, which means you can get cash back out. So if that house is worth $150,000 and the new lender might be willing to refinance you at 80% or 70% of the value of the property, then you could get a loan for... Hold on, I'm going to do the math real quick so I don't mess it up. (laughs) You know, 80%, you can get a loan for $120,000. Now, all of a sudden, you've got all your costs paid. You're getting all your money back, the repairs and the down payment. Everything is taken care of if you can wait those six months or a year to refinance the property. But again, you're going to be paying more in interest. You're going to be paying more costs to do the, the loans. But it's one way to buy a rental property without as much cash, without as much money. You can get your money back, go buy another property, keep repeating the process over and over again. And that's a great way to buy rentals without as much money. Um, You have to make sure you can still cash flow with the higher loan amount. But, you know, a lot of us don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars sitting around to buy rental property after rental property. You have to be creative. You have to find ways to buy them with less cash. Another strategy to buy property without as much money is to live in it. So there are rules for owner-occupants. Usually the banks require you to live in a property for at least one year before you move out, before you rent it out, before you sell. You can usually sell it before that, but they frown upon it if you're selling properties over and over again and not living there for at least one year. But when you buy as an owner-occupant, the down payments are much lower. Your down payment might be 3%, 5%, sometimes even 0% if you qualify for a VA loan, as opposed to 20% you're paying as an investor. Now you're going to have mortgage insurance which could add 100 or $200 a month to your payment. That can really hurt your returns. However, you know, if you're getting a really good deal, if the property still cash flows, it can be worth it to buy a house as an owner-occupant, live there a year, maybe you fix it up while you're living there. After that year, rent it out, go do it again, repeat the process over and over. And if you're getting a conventional loan and you have the property for two or three years and it goes up in value or you bought it right, and it's you know much more valuable than what you paid for it, you might be able to get that mortgage insurance removed, which is a huge help and can be a great advantage to increasing your cash flow. So there's another option for buying rentals when you don't have a lot of money. It's not easy. It takes a lot of sacrifice and hard work to live in a house that you want to eventually rent out and move a lot. But if you don't have any other options, sometimes you have to take the hard way. You have to make those sacrifices to get ahead in life. Another thing to consider as well is if you live in a property for two years as an owner-occupant in the United States and you sell that house, you most likely will not pay any income taxes on the capital gains on the money you make. So another huge advantage of living in a house and using your owner-occupant status to your advantage to make money in real estate. And I'll kind of use that transition to switch into fix and flipping. Because if you're selling a house, you're not really holding it as a rental, you're flipping it. But that can be a great way to get money, to make money, to start a flipping business is by living in a house for two years that you got an awesome deal on it, you know, making, doing some work to it and then selling it. But if you're going to flip a house that you don't live in, it takes money as well. And what you'll find out is when you try and flip a house and you go talk to big banks, they'll just tell you no. They're like, nope, we're not going to give you a loan. We don't, we don't loan on flips. So it can be tough to get started because the big banks won't loan to you. Some smaller banks might loan to you. If you have some experience or 
a really good relationship to them. But a lot of the smaller banks that loan to flippers want to see someone who's flipped before has experience doing it. So that can make it tough as well. But what you will find is there are hard money lenders who will loan to flippers. And these loans, again, more expensive. You're going to pay a much higher interest rate. They're only a year in length usually, sometimes a little longer. But most of the time, you can only have them for a year. And although some will loan 100% of a deal. Most hard money lenders will not loan 100% of a deal. You're going to be looking at 90% of the purchase price plus maybe 100% of the repairs, which is still a good deal. I mean, if you're flipping a house that you're buying for $100,000, that means they'll loan 90000 on the purchase price. You'll have to pay 10000 And 100% of the repairs, if it needs thirty grand of work, they'll finance that thirty grand as well. However, just because if the hard money lender will finance $10,000, does not mean that's all the money you're going to need. You're going to need more money than that. They'll want to see you have reserves. They'll want to see you have some backup money as well. You're probably going to need to have at least $25,000 in the bank to f- start flipping houses if you want to use a hard money lender. They're going to want to see that you have money, you've got some skin in the game, you're not just financing all of it and can disappear and leave them with a property. So if you're flipping a house in that $100,000 price range, you know, lower stuff, you're probably going to need $20,000, $25,000 in the bank. That is using a hard money lender because not only will you have repair costs, but you'll have carrying costs. You'll have taxes to pay, insurance to pay, maintenance, utilities, plus the repairs as well. They don't always pay right away. You know, when you finance repairs with a hard money loan, what usually happens is they'll do draws. Once you get a certain amount of repairs done, they'll go inspect the property and they'll pay you what's called a draw. Maybe they'll have four draws and they'll pay you $10,000 once they think $10,000 of work is done. So they're not paying you all that money right away up front. You've got to have the work done, maybe possibly even pay your contractor first, and then they'll come back and reimburse you. That's another reason why you need to have that money in the accounts to pay contractors, even though technically the hard money loan is paying them. So if you don't have that money, how do you flip houses? How can you get started? Or what if, you know, you have to buy houses for $300,000 in your market because that's the entry price point and it's just really hard to find cheaper houses. Well, there are options for that as well. The first thing I would say is, already mentioned, buy as an owner-occupant, wait your two years, wait your year, flip a house the long, slow way. It's not a bad route to go if, if your only option is nothing or that. There are also the opportunities to invest with a partner. Maybe there's an investor who has money or you have an uncle a family member, a friend who has a lot of money who's willing to partner with you. A typical situation is the person flipping the house finds the deal, uh, does the work either finding a contractor or works in the house themselves, gets the house sold, takes care of the entire process. The person putting up the money gets 50% of the deal. The person who finds the deal and does the work gets 50% of the profits as well. That's very common. You give up a lot of money to have a partner, but that partner is also risking a lot of things by using someone to flip a house, they may not make as much as you think. There might not be that much profit in it compared to the risk they're taking if something goes wrong. So that's one way to invest when you don't have a lot of money. You can also try to find private investors who would lend you money, loan you, you know, purchase price and repairs, which can be difficult, but possible. But, you know, usually partner is the best way to go if you have no money to flip houses. And attracting a partner is not easy. Usually, if you have a really good deal and you know how to find those deals, you're including all the costs, you can show them the numbers, that's the best way to find a partner is find those deals first. Once you've found deals and prove you can make money in the business, it's much easier to find money. But if you're out there trying to find money first, you haven't looked for a deal, you haven't figured out how to find a good deal, you just assume you'll find a good deal at some point, it's going to be much, much harder to find that partner. So learn your market, learn how to find those deals, and then later find the money and how to actually buy them. All right, so we've got some kind of idea of what it takes to flip houses, um, some kind of idea of what it takes to buy rental properties. The owner-occupant route is always there. What if you have no money, like nothing? (laughs) You have no partners. There's no way you can get started flipping or buying rentals. Well, there are options. Um, Wholesaling is obviously taught all over the place as the way to get rich in real estate without much work, without any money, without any credit. I'm never that excited as others seem to be about teaching wholesaling. I think there's a lot of opportunity there. You can make a lot of money, but it is a ton of work and you will need some money. And the basics behind wholesaling is that you find really good deals. 
you get them under contract and you sell them to other investors who may buy them as rentals or flips. So you have to work really hard to get those really good deals. It's, they don't just fall in your lap. You have to be an expert at finding deals. You also have to have money for marketing. If you're driving for dollars, which is driving around looking for vacant houses, you need money for gas. You need money to send letters to people. You need money to call people, talk to them, or, or at least time. If you want to do a direct mail campaign, which I've been doing recently, um, I actually have gotten two deals from my, my direct mail campaign. I just closed on one to, another one today. You need money. I mean, I'm spending a couple thousand dollars a month on my direct mail campaign with no guarantees anything's going to happen. So you need to have money to really be a super successful wholesaler. But you can start out slow. You can start out trying to do a deal here, a deal there, and slowly move up, slowly increase your business. So that's one way. If you have no money, you know, no partners, no financial help, wholesaling is a way you can get started in real estate. Another thing to look at is becoming a real estate agent. Again, you'll need some money. You can't just jump into the business with zero dollars. You, know, you have to get your license, which can be a couple hundred dollars to a thousand dollars, depending on where you're at. You have to pay for you know licensing fees, MLS fees. You know, it can easily cost a couple thousand dollars to initially become an agent. And then there's the trick of it may take a few months before you sell a house. So you have to have living expenses saved up or some other job, something you can do to make money or have money saved up while you're first learning how to be an agent, how to sell houses. Doesn't mean it's impossible, but just know there's no easy solution. There's no easy way out to get rich in real estate without hard work or without having some money. I would say that there are some ways to jump into the real estate agent business without a lot of money. One is joining a team. Find a successful team. Find another successful agent. Convince them to start a team with you on it. Volunteer to help with paperwork, busy tasks, whatever you can do. Say, hey, hire me part-time, let me be your assistant, pay me an hourly wage while I learn the business. I'll get my license, I'll help you any way I can. You don't have to pay me a ton of money, I just need enough money to survive before I start selling houses. Another way is to have a part-time job that is flexible. I don't think being a part-time agent is easy. If you have a full-time day job, you need to have a flexible schedule where you can meet people, talk to people, be available during the day and on weekends. We have a new agent joining our team. And what he does right now is he drives for Uber. And I was thinking about it, that is like the perfect job for a real estate agent. So we drive around all the time anyway. <laughs> so you should have a decent car. And you're flexible. You can turn on Uber whenever you want. You can turn it off. If you have someone who calls you, wants to see a house. If you have someone, you know, a title company calls you, turn off Uber, talk to them, go do your business. When you're done, Go back, drive for Uber again, or Lyft, or whoever you, you want to use. It's really an interesting part-time job that I think would work really well for real estate agents. And if you're an investor, you know, that might work too. You want to drive for dollars? Go drive for Uber. You, you'll get paid to drive around, and you know, you probably shouldn't be writing down addresses and scoping out stuff too, obviously, when you're carrying people in your car. But when you're on the way to see them, when you're waiting for fares, Go drive around, look for houses, kind of like the perfect part-time gig for a real estate investor or real estate agent. So there are ways to get involved in the business without a lot of money. The more you have, the better off you'll be. If you're struggling with saving money for with rentals, you know, for flips, whatever it is, it's not all about finding, you know, ways to buy with less money. Sometimes it's about making more money. Like I said, you know, ask yourself, hey. Can I do better at my job? Can I get a promotion? Is there something else I could do that makes me more money that I have more fun at? Do I want to become a real estate agent? Do I want to be a full-time investor? Do I want to add a second job? You know, it's not the best option for everybody, but for some people it's worth it. So look at your whole situation. You know, how much money you need for what your ultimate goals are. How are you going to get to those goals? If you don't have much money now, what will you do to start making money now to get into a position where you'll have money to invest it? Once you start making money to invest, invest in properties and flips or rentals? How can you get more money? Are you going to take all of your profits and, and dump them back into the business? Are you going to become an agent to make commissions and make even more money? Going to start wholesaling properties to make more money that you can invest into the business? What are you going to do? Um, there's a lot of ways to make money in real estate. None of them are easy. None of them are a magic ticket that will work, you know, <laughs> overnight without putting in the time, the effort. But it's a fantastic business to be in. A ton of opportunities out there. 
you just have to figure out a plan, write out your plan, and then get to work at it. Just start doing it, taking action, and hopefully soon you'll get to where you want to be. won't happen overnight, but the sooner you start, the sooner you, you will get there. All right, that's all I've got for this episode. Hope you enjoyed it. As always, leave me a comment below. Let me know if there's anything I can help you out with, if you liked it, disliked it. And of course, I appreciate reviews as well. All right, thanks for listening, and we'll be back next week.